Welcome, welcome, or and welcome to me too. So thank you, folks, Noam and other folks of San Francisco Dharma Collective for having me here. My name is Venerable Dhammadipa, and uh, very, very happy to uh, be part of this ongoing conversation around the Noble Eightfold Path. And our topic for today is right mindfulness. And uh, we'll get to that in a few moments. But I think just in keeping with the typical uh, format of the program that we've been doing, uh, I would like to start by offering folks the uh, refuges and the five precepts. So we can do that and then we'll do a brief chant on the Noble Eightfold Path itself before we go into the meditation. And then around 2.25 or so, we'll shift to the Dhamma talk. So Noam, if you could bring up those uh, five precepts, the, um, the refuges and the five precepts. Yeah, so the Buddha spoke about two different kinds of followers. There we go. And he said, there are, well, he spoke about many different kinds of followers, frankly, but in, in this one in particular that I want to talk about today, he spoke about two different kinds of followers, Dhamma followers and faith followers. And he said, so some people come to be practitioners and be involved in the Dhamma by virtue of their faith, their deep trust and confidence in the wisdom of the Buddha himself and the others who have followed his path and uh, found their own wisdom. And he said, that's one, one group of people who begin with faith and then go forward on the path in faith that there are some wisdom that uh, they might discover on their own by following the teachings. And then there are other folks who come to the path and they want to understand. And those are the Dharma followers. Those are folks who take in the Dhamma and really think about it and consider it and apply it. And then by virtue of applying it and finding that it is for their own welfare, for their own benefit, actually, then they too develop trust and confidence. So it was interesting that he said, eventually, everyone on the path will develop some trust and some confidence in finding wisdom, discovering wisdom by this, uh, this way. But so whether you're a Dhamma follower or a faith follower, either way, you might decide that you would like to take refuge in the triple, what we call the triple gem. So the Buddha, the Buddha himself, the historical Buddha, and also the representation of the uh, ultimate awakening capacity ultimate awakening nature that we all have. The Dhamma representing both the teachings and reality itself, a description of reality itself. And the Sangha, so Sangha originally meaning the awakened uh, followers of the Buddha and then expanded to mean all of the ordained Sangha and then now in recent times expanded even further to mean the fourfold Sangha meaning monks and nuns and lay men and lay women. And now we'll have to come up with another term, the multifold sangha, perhaps for all of the genders that we might include in this beautiful path. 
So here we are. So taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha as a place of sanity in the middle of a world that could definitely use some sanity. So I'll just uh, go ahead and chant. And if everyone is muted, then you can chant together with me at the same time. So I won't leave any pauses for you to echo call and response. We'll just do it all at the same time. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddha Saranang Gachami Damang Saranang Gachami Sanghang Saranang Gachami Dutyampi Buddhang Saranang Chami Dutyampi Dhammang Saranang Chami Dutyampi Sanghang Saranang Chami Tatyampi Buddhang Saranang Chami Tatiampi Dhammang Sadananga Chami Tatiampi Sanghang Sadananga Chami Te Sadananga Manami Tang And then the five precepts. I'd like to just say that. Uh, one way to understand the precepts is the Buddha explaining to us how kama works. When we follow this way of living, then it will lead to the unfolding of kama that will help us on the path. So please only take precepts that you intend to keep and uh, feel supported by the fact that they're are many, many people also trying to live this sort of making their, their best effort, making a good effort to live this sort of ethical, uh, harmless life. So I'll say the Pali, and then I'll uh, recite, I'll chant the Pali, and then I'll recite the English, and you all can, if you know the Pali, certainly chant that, but, um, but recite the English together with me. Hana tipata vera manisi kapadang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adina dana vera manisi kapadang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame sumi chachara vera manisi kapadang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musawada vera manisi kapadang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. Sura Meraya Majapamadatana Vera Manisi Kapadang Samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. 
Imani pancha si kapadani si lena sukatinyanti si lena poka sampada si lena nibutinyanti tasma si la iso taye. These are the five precepts. The precepts are the source of true happiness, true wealth, true peacefulness. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Yeah. Let virtue be purified. Beautiful. So we have established our intention for living a, a beautiful, ethical, harmless life. And that helps actually, the Buddha said that's uh, actually even a prerequisite for being able to make progress in the meditative sphere of the path. So then we could move on to the next chant there, Noam, if we move on to the Noble Eightfold Path. And um, I don't recall right now how many times it is that we've been chanting those. Maybe just do it three times through for the sake of using Buddhism's, one of Buddhism's favorite numbers. All right, so we'll chant just those Pali words and that are in the black there, right underneath the English translations. We'll just chant those eight were those eight phrases in a row three times around. All right. Sama Diti Sama Sankapa Sama Wacha Sama Kamanta Sama Ajiva Sama Vayama Sama Sati Sama Samadhi Sama Diti Sama Sankapa Sama Wacha, Sama Kamanta, Sama Jiva, Sama Vayama, Sama Sati, Sama Samadhi, Sama Diti, Sama Sankapa, Sama Wacha, Sama Kamanta, Sama Jiva, Sama Vayama, Sama Sati, Sama Samadhi. Sadhu. Great. Thank you, Noah. Beautiful. So at this point, I'd like to just move directly into the guided meditation. So go ahead and settle yourself into a grounded, relaxed, alert position. So you may want to start by just rocking the body side to side or front to back. Just loosening up the hips and the perhaps tendency to lean toward one side or another. And then slowly allowing the rocking to come to the center. And as best you can, allowing the vertebrae of the spine to line up and support each other. And then with that alignment, allowing the head to find centered, balanced place, support. 
supported by the spine. Perhaps experimenting with it a little bit further back than what you usually do. Allowing the hands to be flat on the thighs. If you want to relax the energy of the body, or bringing the hands together in the center of your lap to gather the energy of the body. state of alignment, you can allow the bones of the body to carry the weight and the muscles to relax and soften and drop down toward your seat. Go softening, widening the muscles as best you can, just inviting them to let the bones do the work. And then opening the awareness to the whole of the body. Just taking in the whole body at once. Open awareness of the whole body. And perhaps you're noticing the whole body and then you discover the breath breathing the body. No need to change it at all. Just allowing the breath to continue nourishing the body as it naturally does. Then moving the attention to the feet, noticing the sensation of touch in one of the feet. Just observing. your foot is placed, what is the sensation of touch on the foot? Just 
staying with it, noticing the sensation of touch. Perhaps observing whether it's pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. Now shifting, slowly shifting the attention of the body all the way slowly up the torso to the mouth and the sensation of taste. Could be neutral, could be pleasant, could be unpleasant. How is the sensation of taste in this moment? Just staying with it. this moment. Now shifting the smell. Hmm, what kind of smell is present in this moment? Noticing the sensation of smell. Perhaps it's very subtle. sensation of steam, of sight. Whether your eyes are closed or open, there's some sensation, some visual sensation happening. Yeah, so just gently observing. What's the sensation of sight in this moment? And what's the tone of it? Is it unpleasant or pleasant? Or maybe neutral? Nothing to strain, just taking in the visual sensation of sight.
now shifting to sound sensation of sound. Observing the sounds of this moment. Gently receptive to the sounds of the moment. Or unpleasant, or neither. Staying with the sounds of the moment. Finally shifting to the sixth sense. Oh, consciousness. Thought. Breath sensation. Gently observing thought. Just as if they were sounds or smells. Thoughts as objects of the mind. Just phenomena passing through. Staying with it, observing the phenomena of mind, sensations in the mind.
And now for the remainder of the meditation, you can just pick one of those six sense functions. Six sense doors. And stay with that one door. Just receptive to the sensations and the phenomena.
for these last three minutes of the meditation. Opening the awareness to the whole body again. Centered the receptors to the whole body. Being aware of the breath leaving the body. Allow ourselves to pass like a phenomena and stay with the body. So let's take a couple of minutes to stretch out if you need to, if you, if you would like to stand up, move the body, move away from the computer screen, do whatever you need to do to reset for a moment.
So if I ring the bell, if that will help you if they can come back. Welcome back everyone. So this is the time for Dhamma reflection. My name again is Venerable Dhamma Deepa. I go by she, her pronouns. And our topic today is right mindfulness. The seventh of the eight aspects, cores or threads of the noble path, the eightfold noble path. Before I get into my talk, I'd like to go ahead and pay homage to the Triple Gem. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhassa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sangha Namasami Mindfulness. Hmm. There is so much that has been said about mindfulness already. Time Magazine Mindfulness Special Edition at the grocery store checkout. <laughs> that was my most recent surprise. <laughs> and there's still quite a bit that could be said about mindfulness. So hopefully I will be able to share something with you. But I'd like to start, first of all, with a story. A story about many years ago when I was a monastic in Japan. So in Japan, the practice of alms collection is called takuhatsu. And in the fall, we go on aki takuhatsu, fall takuhatsu, it means going out to the 27 or so sub temples of the larger training monastery that I lived in and going and visiting all these little towns in rural Japan and uh, and visiting them and chanting at literally every doorstep in those little towns and chanting the Heart Sutra and collecting dana. And um, one day we were out and so we go out in groups usually uh, everybody except the person who is staying back to cook, uh, or sometimes also the office person, but generally everybody would go, and it was a small monastery, so we'd go out about uh, 20 of us in groups of four, and uh, for whatever reason this day we had split up into a couple of towns, and so there I was, one of two groups of four, and we were in this small village and most Japanese rural villages are, are fairly compact. The, the houses are fairly close together. And so are the streets. The streets were sometimes so small that it's hard to tell, like, what was a street for cars and what was a walking path for people. Um, but in this particular town, it was the other way. We were in this town that had these, like, very long winding roads and the houses were kind of separate, like these big tentacles of an octopus coming out, like, just random, seemingly, uh, roads. And anyway, we got there in the morning and 
started coming to, you know, going door to door as we were uh, doing usually. And nobody had answered the door at numerous places that I'd been. So I'd already been to a whole block full of places and nobody was answering the door. And usually that would be um, kind of no fun because then I don't get to see the people. But on this day, I thought, well, it's a beautiful day outside. And so I'm just going to enjoy the weather and walk these nice, long, windy streets and make my way and not worry about getting lost, which was <laughs> the usual situation for me of getting lost or having to find my group, having my group have to find me. But on this day, I wasn't worried about that at all. And so there I was. And, and uh, so we have this bell that we ring. I should have brought it with me actually from upstairs. This very, very loud bell that we ring as we're going along so that people know that we're around and that we're in the neighborhood. And so I was ringing the bell and listening to the sound of it. And I was enjoying the, the sunshine, the light. It's fall, so it's very nice, crisp, cool temperatures on my skin and feeling the ground under my feet. So we hand wove these little sandals that we walk in and, um, and just, uh, yeah, yeah. Even, you know, how that fall air even has kind of a nice crisp, clean taste to it. So there I was walking and, um, and I looked to my right and to my right, there was a rice paddy. Now, maybe some of you have traveled in that part of the world, you might know, or in other parts of Asia, you might know like rice paddies are everywhere. In rural Japan, they're everywhere, literally. I had probably seen thousands and thousands already in my short time that I had been in Japan, probably at that point about a year or so. And um, yeah, part of that is because people grow rice even in their very small plots. If they have a small home with a small plot of land, they'll, they'll grow rice for their family. But I looked to my right and there was a rice paddy and I was captivated. Like all of a sudden, it was these beautiful colors, this citron green and then emerald and then gold and then and the and the the light was kind of dappled because there's a little bit of clouds and so it would like and they were swaying in the breeze this fall breeze that was happening these stalks of rice so um the rice paddies maybe you know are sort of uh, covered in a, a little bit of water there's a little bit of water standing water at the base of it and then there's this long little stalk like this and then the rice is actually at the end of the stalk. And so the stalks tend to move in the, in the breeze. And this was just the most gorgeous thing I'd ever seen. I like I stopped walking and I just looked and absorbed this scene for a little while. And, um, and then noticed again, behind that patio, there was this little bit of a hill, like a mountain and the brown of the hill coming forth and so on. Anyway, I was stood there for quite a while looking at this and taking it all in. And it wasn't until later that I realized that, um, that what had happened in that moment was that that was just a moment of very, very crisp mindfulness. That was just a moment in which, because I had been tuned into my senses, right, so I was, aware of the light and I was listening to the sound and I was feeling the temperature and I was smelling the air and tasting the air and all of these things that I was, I had this moment of experiencing what Ajahn Brahm speaks about of the bliss of the mindfulness of a, just a regular everyday moment. So even looking at this thing, this rice patty, which is no, big deal, it's a rice patty, was incredibly compelling and, and joyful. And so 
so um, clear that I still remember it to this day. That was, that was 2006 or 2007. I still remember the colors of that particular rice paddy and the movement of the thing. Not because I'm anybody special, but because that is the nature of the compelling um, experience that we have of the world in a moment of deep mindfulness. And I think that up until that point, and so I've been practicing a long, long time by that point. I've been practicing about 19 years at that point. And that up until that moment, I think that I had looked at most things in my life, if not everything, as if I already knew it. As if I already knew it, you know? Or sometimes I, uh, later on I would reflect on when you're when you are around small children and they are learning about the world they have a kind of awe and a kind of observation right and they'll see things that you have just completely overlooked but they're experiencing that with great care so i'd lost that feeling for a very 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 long time until that moment of the rice paddy in japan So this story, this story uh, is intended to put into context a little bit about the potential for mindfulness. It's not that every single uh, practice, every single moment that we're practicing mindfulness is going to be like that. But I think that it points, it points to something about how the, the um, the embodied experience together with the mental experience could click in such a way that there was there was a, there was just a different sensibility about it so for this reason also mindfulness has been compared to like a flashlight like oh whoa suddenly right there is there is a very, a, a very different degree of clarity and experience of what's been there all the time. It's not that there was anything that I was particularly adding to that situation. And so, and so there's also a sense of, of, uh, of waking up to something new as well, right? To waking up to, to, um, a kind of curiosity that could be renewed or new in each moment. A kind of not knowing what's there, even after all these years, even after lots of travel or education or concepts or whatever it is that you think you know, huh? history, experience, whatever it is that you think you know. So there's a freshness and a beauty and a compellingness in that simplicity, in that simplicity. And, and uh, recently I was revisiting this, this very pithy little book, which I recommend if I haven't already, this, this very uh, pithy but handy, and I would say wise book by Bhikkhu Bodhi on the Noble Eightfold Path. So if you're following along with the nuns on the Noble Eightfold Path, this is a very good one. It's just called that, the Noble Eightfold Path the way to the end of suffering by Bhikkhu Bodhi. And he says quite clearly about right mindfulness, he says the task of mindfulness is to clear up the cognitive field, period. To clear up the cognitive field. So that's a very interesting perspective on it, right? So he's not saying that we learn some kind of methodology uh, in terms of becoming mindful. You see what I'm saying? There isn't like a methodology, there isn't a, um, a task at hand necessarily. Mindfulness itself is clearing the cognitive field. So let me go back to a little bit to that. So we're talking about uh, sati, the Pali word, 
but they, many of you know this, and we said it in the chant, Sammasati, right or sound mindfulness. And um, it's, a, it's a kind of heightened form of awareness, or you could call it an attentiveness to experience, a kind of um, presence. Mm -hmm and a clear presence um, in the moment. So it implies a, an in the moment-ness, a, pre, uh, a present moment uh, of bringing oneself here and not being in the past, not being in the future. It also implies a certain kind of non-judgmental quality. We're not talking about interpreting what happened or, or um, deciding whether it's okay or not okay, or how to respond or any of those things. Mindfulness is before that, before that. Those kinds of things might be part of investigation, for example. So if we're thinking in terms of the seven factors, right, of awakening, mindfulness being the first and investigation being the second or third typically path. But mindfulness is uh, as I said, so, so shining the attention like a flashlight in a particular way. Or the traditional metaphor that's used in, in, uh, in the discourses, of course, mindfulness is all throughout the discourses, but one particular metaphor that I, I really enjoy that I, I think is, is uh, help, can be helpful for us is to think about the... Um, the watch person who stands at the gate to the city, right? stands on the top of the wall at the gate to the city and just watch person, right? They are not, they are not counting horses or deciding that that person can't go out or, you know, any other activity. It's just observing what comes in and what comes out. So again, pointing at this kind of um, this interactivity that we experience in every single moment of contact between what we perceive as our inner world and what we perceive as outer world. And that's important. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But I want to also emphasize that mindfulness requires a certain kind of precision. It's not a vague you know, general kind of, yeah, I'm aware of my situation. It requires a certain kind of precision. And I'll tell you a little story about that. And some of you may have heard this story already. So for that, I apologize, but we'll try to give it a little spin. I try to give it a little different spin each time. So we'll see how it goes. So uh, I was at, um, I was co-leading a year long program for lay folks who were practitioners affiliated, so rough, loosely speaking, with San Francisco Zen Center, one of five teachers who was co-leading a year-long program out there. And, um, and so there were 60 people in the program. And so each one of us had 12 folks in our sort of subgroup. And we would meet with our subgroup a couple times a month. And then they would meet with each other once a week. And, and so we would give them some general overarching theme for each month of the year, for the 12 months of the year. But we were just getting started out the first month of the year. And so we gave everybody a homework assignment and the homework assignment was to figure out which foot you put in your skirt or your shorts or your kilt or your dress or your sarong or whatever it is which foot you put in first in your clothes in the morning, right? Simple mindfulness of body exercise. So we gave this to everybody as a homework and uh, about week five or six, so we were moving on to the second topic and I don't recall what the seven, second topic was, but one of the women in my subgroup came to me about week five or six and um, she was, she was a young woman. She'd been practicing for a number of years, maybe three or four years. She, you know, um, 
felt like she should be able to do this homework. And she said to me, I, here I am week five. I still have not figured out which foot I put in my skirt. I get up, I get into the car to go to work and I go, oh my gosh, again, <laughs> I have not yet figured out which foot I put in. And I just, I just, I don't know why I can't get this, but I can't really get this yet. So we had a little talk. So we had to talk about what we had to talk about habit, the habits that we have and how habit is kind of covering up our every day. We think that it's making things easier, but actually what habit is doing is separating us from the experience of the moment. So we talked a little bit about habit. We talked a little bit about um, slowing down, right? It's a busy time. She had a young child. She had, she, she had a three-year-old little girl at that point. So, and she was working out of the house. Her husband was also working out of the house. So it was a busy time in the morning, right? First thing, people are trying to get everything going. So we talked a little bit about slowing down and we talked a little bit about what else? Being present for the moment before the moment you want to observe. Right? Because it's easier with a little bit of continuity, actually, than it is to just turn on the mindfulness at one particular spot. If you're trying, if you have a little bit of continuity, you're more likely to catch it there in the pool. So we talked about all these things. And then, sure enough, about, I don't know, 10 days later or so, she came back and she said, guess what? I said, what? She said, I figured it out. My tendency is that I put my left foot in my skirt first in the morning. And that's not the coolest thing. I said, oh, so what's the coolest thing? And the coolest thing is that my daughter, my three-year-old daughter, also puts her left foot in first. Ah, that is pretty cool, right? And again, so what is she seeing? So she's learned something about her own mindfulness of her body, uh, mindfulness of her own body, right? Mindfulness of her own inner world. She's learned that she can practice right in the midst of busy lay life, umpteen things going on all at the same time. Maybe the most stressful moment of the day, even that period of time there of getting everybody ready to get out the door. But she's also learned something about the world that she lives in and about intimacy with this little being and maybe even a little bit less stress or conflict each morning that she can hand her the left leg of her pants first. Huh? Beautiful, so beautiful. So there's a tremendous potential. There's a tremendous potential that mindfulness brings, again, without adding a single thing, but our intentionality, our willingness to be there for what's happening, to tune into what's actually happening. And there's a freedom actually from the habit pattern, from the habit pattern of mind also, right? So she had been just kind of on autopilot all that time and not even realizing that until that moment of seeing the left foot. So very, very beautiful and a, and a story that I love to tell and one that again, I think demonstrates that the um, the way in which mindfulness is not just about some kind of uh, mental turning, some kind of mental observation, right? but the whole picture of how we're interacting with our environment. So going beyond, it has the potential to help us go beyond the preoccupation with self. So traditionally, the way that right mindfulness is defined is the four satipatthana, the four foundations of mindfulness. 
And that's why we started out with the foot in the shorts uh, exercise, right? Because the first foundation of mindfulness is mindfulness of body. As the Buddha described it, right? So he gives, he gives several practices in the Satipatthana in terms of becoming aware of the breath. And then he talks about a, a study of the features, the actual organs and fluids and things of the body, right? Thinking about the anatomy of a human being. So interesting, right? so interesting. So I don't, uh, don't want to spend a lot of time on the detail of that, but we can, we can come back to that if people are interested. So one is anatomy and looking at the organs. Um, suffice to say that if we open it up, it's not quite as cuddly as it seems to us from the outside, right? That's part of the point of that. Um, and then there's four elements, four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. That's a very excellent uh, meditation to do for elements. So looking at the body as composed of those things, but then also the qualities. So solidity and a kind of softness or fluidity and uh, temperature or um, also chemistry like digestion that's part of the fire element and then air representing movement representing movement and also to some extent representing space and space and consciousness was added later and or we think added later according to the scholars in the agamas in the chinese versions of the text but in the pali what we see are the four and then the other uh, study of the body, mindfulness of body, and the Satipatthana is the corpse meditations. So thinking about the inevitability of our own death. This is not for everyone, let me say that. It's not something that you should do without the support of others. And if it um, brings up a lot of fear or despair and definitely set it down. Even in the Buddhist time, there are some suttas about um, folks who um, who had a difficult time with that particular teaching. But I think that the reality, us, you know, one of the things that I have been very heartened to see, particularly as someone who later after my Japanese training had uh, chose to go and spend some years in chaplaincy both in the hospital and in hospice, um, one of the things that I'm heartened to see is that there's more conversation about death in um, American society now than there used to be. I think that that's something that's becoming a little bit more approachable, that conversation. Uh, so mindfulness of body and then shifting from mindfulness of body, the next one is mindfulness of feeling. That's the second of the four foundations. So those ones that I just mentioned were all together in the first foundation, mindfulness of body, and then second foundation is mindfulness of feeling. And I brought my only and therefore my favorite prop that I use for Dhamma talks, which is the contact, what I call the contact ball. That's right, you can come look there, Bill. So feeling arises out of contact. And what is contact? The Buddha said contact is when you have a sense organ and a sense object, the object that goes with that particular sense organ and conscious awareness. And when those three come together, then there's something called contact, right? So just as we were doing in the meditation earlier, that's why we did a six senses meditation. So you have the ear, and then when there's a sound that comes into contact with the ear and a consciousness, that's important that there's some conscious awareness, right? So if you're asleep, for example, there might not be a conscious awareness of the sound happening there. So that's not a contact that's going to bring up the same kind of feeling thing. 
or if you are uh, in a coma, for example, in fact, one of the ways that medically people are defined to be dead is when we contact them, we do things like, we, the doctors, do things like poke them or do a clap or something and see that there's no brain activity that responds to that. That's one of the, our approximations, approximations for awareness is brain activity, but don't be limited to that by any stretch. In any event, the contact ball. So this is what happens. So you have an ear, you have a sound meets your ear, and then you have an awareness of that. And then what happens is that, according to the Buddha, you have a moment of ear consciousness. And that ear consciousness starts and then it changes. It does its little thing. It's not the same the whole time, but then it has a definite ending. Okay. You have a moment of consciousness of each kind of sense consciousness. And this is also why we looked at the mind. We sat with the mind as an organ of consciousness because there can also be feeling tones, right? So feeling tones are whether it's pleasant unpleasant or neutral. Feeling tones associated with what? With thoughts as mind phenomena. Okay. So studying feeling tones, that's your second foundation of mindfulness. And then the third foundation of mindfulness is mind, the mindfulness of mind. This one, that's a big topic. I'm going to probably talk about that tonight with the Berkeley Sangha. So if you don't have any else to do the rest of the day. <laughs> you always tune in later, 6.30 tonight with the Berkeley Sangha. Uh, mindfulness of mind is something along the lines of, uh, you could say, the characteristics or the attributes of mind. Different from mind states. Usually mind states would be in the fourth character, in the fourth Satipatthana, which are the Dhammas Right. referred to as the Dhammas. So the Dhammas are uh, typically, again, looking at the Agamas, slightly different than they are in the Pali text, but the two uh, categories, the two areas that we see in all of the parallels are the five hindrances and the seven factors of awakening. And looking at those, what we see is that uh, one way that I'd like to sum them up is to say, it's looking at states of mind that lead to greater suffering or states of mind that lead to freedom from suffering. That's the fourth Satipatthana. And the third one, again, looking at the attributes of mind or the characteristics of mind, it's mind, you might say, as the container for those states, the kind of mind which is which is, can be, for example, one of the attributes that's uh, mentioned by the Buddha and the Satipatthana is, is it a mind that's constrained or is it a mind that's open? Is it a mind that's confused, deluded, or is it a mind that's liberated? So mindfulness of mind is looking at, you could say, the, the general characteristic of a mind in the moment. So one way to think about that, one way to touch into that, it's not a Satipatthana practice, but in the Brahma Vihara practice, right? If you're doing a radiating Brahma Vihara, that's your mind, that idea of the light going out, that's your mind, right? So at the end of a Brahma Vihara, to come back to a reflection of, oh, how is the mind now? This, this, incredibly vast, bright, joyous mind of a Brahma Vihara. Not a particular state, it's not thinking about one thing or another. It has that attribute though, of the luminosity. So now I've already run over my time and goodness knows, as I said, there's so much more that could be said, but I want to say Thank you all for your presence and your practice. And um, please be well and take care of one another and be safe and be mindful. I'll just chant a very brief 
blessing. Bhavati sava mangala rakanta sava devata sava buddha nubhavena sadasoti pavantate Bhavati sava mangala rakanta sava devata Sabadama nubhavena sadasoti pavantate Bhavati sabha mangala rakanti sabha devata sabha sangha nu bhavena sata soti bhavantu te means by the power of the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha may we ever be well. <laughs>